Namaste and greetings. I, Simi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director of Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPI hashtag web policy learning. We are gathered today for an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy, praxis for a peaceful and gender just world order organized weekly every Friday of September, starting today. This training course is organized by Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, India Office and IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center, GISC, IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi. I would like to start off the program by remembering the great Madam Hansa Mehta, who was India's representative to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. While the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being adopted by the United Nations, she strongly opposed the phrase, all men are born equal, and fiercely advocated for what led to the adoption of Article 1 of the Declaration that all human beings are born free and equal. Now let me give you a brief background of the program. Feminist foreign policy, relegated to the margins for decades, is slowly gaining much deserved recognition as a result of the efforts of peacemaking, peace building, peacekeeping by transnational feminist solidarity and henceforth. A feminist foreign policy provides a powerful lens through which we can counter the violent global systems of power, that is patriarchy, racism, cultural nationalism, imperialism and militarism that leave the majority of the population in perpetual status of vulnerability and despair. It puts the promotion of gender equality and women's right at the center of a nation's diplomatic agenda. Taking a cue from the official European, foreign European Union foreign policy, a progressive feminist foreign policy consists of three R's, which is rights, representation, and resources. According to the International Peace Institute, when women participate in peace processes, agreements are more likely to last longer and to be forged in the first place. The time is right for instituting a feminist foreign policy by India and by all other nations. Hence, this course will provide the participants a nuanced perspective on the challenges towards gender equality, locally, nationally, regionally, and globally and advocate that the voices against gender biases must be made more vocal, which would aid in the steady elimination of exclusive masculine agencies over a period of time. The program themes for this online monsoon school are gender, peace, and security, which will be covered today. For the forthcoming weeks, the themes are gendered dimensions of the United Nations Security Council, gender and sustainable development discourses, gender, international relations, and diplomacy. The chair of the program is Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting distinguished professor, Impri, and eminent economist and feminist scholar. This course will be conducted by various expert resource persons comprising well-known academicians, ambassadors, and feminist peace educators who have great experience gained in the field along their expertise. Dr. Swarna Raja Gopalan, Dr. Wahida Nainar, Professor Roxana Marinescu, Professor Vibhuti Patel, Professor Meenal Srivastha, special remarks by Ambassador Anil Trigunayat, and Professor Nil Nilima Srivastha. The conveners of this program are Ms. Jyoti Rawal from FES India, Dr. Simi Mehta, and Dr. Arjun Kumar from IMPRI. I welcome you all to this enlightening, de enlightening deliberation and thank you for being interested in putting your time, energy and efforts into understanding the emerging issues concerning the impacts of policies in promoting gender equality and helping us bring together the practitioners and participants through this course for impactful policy research and action. The course outline and reading resources are available on the event page for your, for your kind perusal. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind the housekeeping announcements. Please join the meeting on time. 
there will be q and a session after each presentation share your questions on the q and a box only the questions must not be posted as an anonymous anonymous attendee ensure that your questions are precise and please refrain from making general comments in the question to save time now without any further ado let us start our program it is my honor to invite the co convener of the program ms jyoti rawal to share her few words and invite professor vibhuti patel for her inaugural remarks jyoti ma'am over to you thank you so much thank you so much uh, dr simi mehta for this wonderful introduction of the webinar series and of the panel today and also for setting the tone for the event talking about the sessions that are going to be dealt with in the forthcoming weeks dear dr swarna raja gopalan dear dr vibhuti patel dear dr arjun kumar dear participants it is my pleasure to be extending a very warm welcome on behalf of the free shape of stiftung to all of you to the first session of the fas impre webinar series on feminist foreign policy praxis for a peaceful and gender just world order a big thank you to the impre team and to dr vibhuti patel that we are gathered together here in this room kick starting our webinar series a very special welcome today goes to our key speaker dr swarna raja gopalan political scientist and feminist peace educator from the prajna trust based in chennai thank you so much swarna ji most of all for your time and generosity really look forward to listening to you today feminist foreign policy primarily aims at promotion of values and good practices to achieve gender equality the practice was initiated by margaret wallstrom the swedish former former swedish foreign affairs minister and sweden was the first country way back in 2014 to have adopted a feminist foreign policy followed by canada france libya spain mexico and germany feminist foreign policy is seen as an approach that looks at feminist rights more from the point of view of human rights than rights or issues of a specific gender in the fast changing realm of international relations and foreign policies countries do not have permanent alliances or partnerships but countries certainly do have permanent interests and to be in the pursuit of gender justice is something all countries strive for and hence there's a very sharp need at this point of time to be looking at our policies both development as well as foreign policies with a gender lens we are aware that in the indian context despite a constitutional mandate providing equality to people of all genders patriarchal mindsets continue to prevail amongst men and women and the ingrained societal and gender norms continue to hamper the path to equality over the years the fierce shape of stiftung the organization that i represent which is committed to the values of social democracy so we have tried to address the aspect of gender equity through our various activities fes is one of the oldest foundations of germany dedicated to the principles of peace solidarity and social justice from our core mission of promoting social justice we derive the light motif for promoting gender justice we have offices in about 100 countries worldwide with our head office being in berlin and in the gender unit of our india office we've been working on women in work women in politics and on the issues of gender sensitization but today we are here to talk about the feminist foreign policy and how the issues of gender peace and security are intertwined we are really looking forward to listening to uh, dr swarna raja gopalan and without further ado i will request uh, dr vibhuti patel to please take the event forward thank you so much nam please unmute thank you jyoti ma'am vibhuti ma'am if you can unmute thank you jyoti ji uh, dr suvarna rajgopalan uh, dr arjun kumar dr simi mehta for uh, initiating this monsoon school on this important theme of feminist foreign policy praxis for a peaceful and gender just world before we start the session i would like to pay offer the tribute to 
two stalwarts of Indian women's movement, Sona Shukla, today is her first death anniversary, and Gauri Di, who passed away, Gauri Chaudhary, uh, from Delhi uh, Women's Movement, and both of them, though work locally, they work with the community, but they always had global perspective, and in practice, they also supported and also proactively work for the transnational feminist solidarity. Now, coming to the today's theme, like, Feminist foreign policy is the most recent innovation aiming at transformative and right-based approach across all uh, national policies. And formal announcement of feminist foreign policies was made in 2014 in Sweden by the was fem, uh, Swedish government. After that, in 2017, Canadian feminist foreign assistance policy uh, was put in place. And uh, in France and Luxembourg, it was uh, adopted in 2019 and Mexican feminist foreign policy came into existence in 2020. We all know that both Mexico and France also hosted gender equality forum jointly with United Nations women in uh, which women leaders of 64 countries deliberated upon damage caused by the pandemic and launched a global acceler acceleration plan for gender equality and raised $40 billion to implement the action agenda. In 2021, Spain announced feminist foreign policy, recognizing that democracy, peace, prosperity, and social progress require the full participation of women. And feminist foreign policy aims to strive for anti-racist and decolonizing perspective. I think that has also been reiterated over the last two years. The first instance of feminist foreign, uh, foreign policy, as Dr. Simi Mehta uh, uh, told us, that it was the Hansa Mehta. Uh, and as an Indian delegate in the United Nations Human Rights Council, that she, how she endangered the UDHR, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, feminist foreign policy and feminist diplomacy has its genesis in transnational feminist solidarity efforts during the decade of 1975 to 85. And the con this concept that calls for state to promote values and good practices to achieve gender equality and to guarantee all women uh, enjoy their human rights through diplomatic relations. And the practice was uh, uh, initiated by the Swedish Foreign Affairs Minister, as both my previous speakers say. Feminist forest policy is prevalent in the peace building effort in war and civil war torn countries, international development aid, and with an objective of financing for gender equality by reducing gender gaps in education, healthcare, employment, decision making power, and by addressing gender based violence through direct intervention. So Thus, feminist foreign policy also aims for gender parity in diplomacy by increasing women's representation in the post of ambassadors. And it, the, the five important concerns of this policy is to fight against sexual and sexist violence, education for women and girls, and, uh, and also of boys, men and boys, economic emancipation of women across the world, evolving fem women in politics and decision making, involving them actively and involving women in the peace negotiations and treaties. So to address these issues in the diplomatic missions regarding marginalized sections such as ethnic, linguistic, religious minorities, oppressed caste and nationalities who continue to face intersectional operations, I think that is a very important dimension of this feminist uh, foreign policy. It's a central concern of gender equality which ensures that women and girls enjoy fundamental human rights that the global community must strive for as an obligation within our international commitments and also a prerequisite to achieve broader foreign policy goals of peacemaking, peace building and peacekeeping, security and sustainable development. So this universal understanding needs to be interpreted in an intersectional feminist perspectives that is responsive to post-colonial socio-cultural reality hierarchical international relations, local political dynamics, lived experiences of citizens in a specific country and diverse voices need to be taken into consideration. So uh, I think uh, in uh, first ever summit of uh, feminist foreign policy in April, 2022, uh, uh, that was 2022, just four months back, the Sweden Accord, the central, uh, 
slogan of the women's movement, women's rights are human rights, and highlighted gender-based violence, trafficking, refugee crisis. The summit accepted the need for uh, like a paradigm shift from uh, being reactive to being proactive and feminist perspectives in international relations demands deconstruction of hegemonic power structures and systems that create policies that favor microscoping minority on this planet. Hence, it is imperative to challenge patriarchal system of injustice, exclusion, exploitation, uh, oppression, marginalization that perpetuate inequality. Uh, feminist foreign policy not only focuses on international relations between nation states, but also political cultures and schools of thought that reflect their economic, political priorities, human rights of the socioeconomic and, uh, and underserved sections. India also is committed, at least in principle, uh, India uh, is committed to uh, feminist foreign policy. It ratified Convention on Elimination of All Forms of uh, discrimination against women in 1993. India also promised to implement UN MDG uh, goal number three on uh, empowerment of women in the year 2000. In 2005, India responded to UN call for gender responsive budgeting. India proactively supported UN peacekeeping efforts in Liberia in 2007 by sending all women peacekeeping contingent uh, that was applauded by the global leaders. And in 2015, India sent three women police units for UN peacekeeping mission in Africa in 2015. India also officially adopted sustainable development goal with emphasis on SDG 5 of gender equality. So India has been contributing to foreign assistance for empowerment of women by offering technical support to SAC development funds, uh, South Asian Regional Cooperation Fund. And in 2020, India became a member of United Nations Commission on Status of Women, ECOSOC. Still, there are many gaps in the foreign services and diplomatic positions, propose, proportion of women at the higher echelons of power structure is limited. India's ratification of CEDAW is also partial as it has not ratified the optional protocol that allows direct access to the CEDAW committee if the national redressal system is are found to be apathetic or hostile. Indian women peacekeeping forces in Liberia and Africa were mostly involved in providing care and support. So it is in this context that feminist uh, policy uh, perspective needs a much more detailed deliberation. And today we have Dr. Swarna Rajgopan to kickstart the deliberations uh, in this monsoon school. I request Dr. Swarna Rajgopal to take over. Thank you, Vibhuti, Jyoti, Simi, Arjun. I'm not a very hierarchical person, so I will not do madams and Gs and sirs. And I invite you to not do the same with me either. Um, you know, you've heard a lot of information already, and I'm wondering, you know, if my presentation is going to be redundant, but um, let's start at the very beginning, a very good place to start. So I am going to actually um, can find my, I'm actually going to go over basics. I'm going to pretend that this is in fact a school. This is your first session because if we could start midway, you know, we're getting into this conversation on feminist foreign policy somewhere after the journey has begun. But if we want, to be understanding where people are coming from and what questions to ask and what we actually want to build, not just climbing onto a bus because it seems to be passing in a particular direction, then we need to start at the very beginning. So this is what my presentation is going to be about. It's going to be an introduction to basics that some of you will know, some of you will know less well, but uh, you know, a little revision is good for all of us, especially me. So gender peace security, and I think the point of departure, every time I do this, not just for people I'm speaking with is, what do these words mean? Defining key terms, because we cannot take for granted that all of us understand each of them in exactly the same way. We come into sessions like this, we come into discourses with a particular baggage, with a particular set of understandings. So also just to clarify where my presentation comes from, here are the ways in which I think of these words. You know, very much 
I never went to a feminist theory class or a gender studies course. I'm someone who learned about feminism and gender from my akkas like Vibhuti. And I followed them and I made sense of what they did. And I said, oh, she said it that way. Oh, that means that. And literally put my universe together. And now I learn every day from younger people who come much better trained in theory and concepts. And I shamelessly copy what they say. So now I understand gender as meaning much more than grammar, much more than women. But essentially, the entire package of ideas that we hold, that we nurture, that we perpetuate about individuals, about gender roles, stereotyping, what do I expect a woman to be like? What do I expect a man to be like? How do I respond to someone who does not look exactly like I think they should be looking with this name or with that dress? So gender is this entire package or mess that we carry in our heads. And it's a spectrum, right? It's no longer binary. It's not men, women. It's all the things that we feel, that we are, the ways in which we identify, the ways in which we want to dress, the ways in which we fall in love. It's that entire spectrum of human experience that relates to this category. And how we experience reality is not it is largely and universally determined by gender because all of us have gender ideas, but it is also determined by other intersections, meaning my gender, but also my class, also my caste, also my belonging to the majority community, also the ridiculous amount of privilege I have had in accessing a good education, you know? Or as we would say in Indian culture, the wonderful karma I brought with me so that early in my life, I got to meet good people, intelligent people, passionate people, and to follow in their footsteps. Patriarchy determines how we think about gender and how we think, think about gender influences how we think about ourselves, our relationships, the world around us, and what we think policy should be like. For instance, if we think if our gender sensitivity is still lodged in a place where we think, you know, poor women, ladies are so soft, they are so weak, we must protect them. Then when we make policies in our party manifestos, we will make them around protection. You know, put CCTV, don't let her out at night, no night shift for women, you know full school uniform with covered face. This will be how we think. So this small thing that is inside my heart that you cannot see affects the entire spectrum of the way I think about the world. And heaven forbid, my views should be narrow and limited, but you give me a lot of power, then bus, you know, we're in trouble. Then come to the second word in this title, peace. Peace is usually when we start thinking about peace, we say not war, war and peace. Tolstoy wrote the book, we are all stuck there, war and peace. Then you think, no, no, but peace is also about feeling safe. When I go home alone at night after work, I shouldn't be assaulted. You know, the old thing we used to say in history textbooks, if there was a good king, we would say, they would build haramshalas, they would plant trees, and women could, old women could walk in the night with a pot of gold on their head and not be attacked. Freedom, peace is also freedom. Because if I can't tell you what I think, and I'm just sitting with it in my mind, then I'm not really, I'm saying to you essentially, I'm not safe to say what I want. So peace is freedom. Peace is fairness. Peace means that when, when you speak and I speak, we have the, a fair chance to be heard. When you and I apply for the same job with the same credentials, we have a fair chance of being hired. Peace is justice because without justice, you can't be 
at peace. You're constantly going to be in ferment over what happened to me. Ye kitna anyayata, this should not have happened. That should, peace begins with justice. Until and unless you have justice, you're only going to be playing house house with peace. Peace is well-being. And this, if we have not learned this from the coronavirus pandemic, then we all deserve to be, forget non-violence, we all deserve a slap on our faces. Because if we are not well, what are we? What did we see in the second phase, second uh, surge? That is not a peaceful society. A society where families are in tears because there are no hospital beds, there is no oxygen, there are no ventilators and not a peaceful society. Peace is being in harmony with nature, not having your habitat, your natural home denuded by some misguided notion of death. Look at Bangalore, not in harmony with nature that urban development is now causing havoc. There is no water in posh localities. There is no water to bathe, no water to drink. And then, you know, peace is, the, is how you live. Are you kind? Are you compassionate? Are you warm? Do you, you get angry about everything? Do you carry a whole host of grievances? When I was in fifth standard, no, she said about me, is that who you are? Then you are not at peace even in paradise. So when we work with young children, sometimes we say, what is peace? And they say, peace is a calm feeling. And actually, you don't need anything more than that by way of a presentation from me. So chalo, gender, peace, kadia, what is security? So the easiest meaning of security is freedom from threat. I'm not afraid of anything. I'm secure. But who's security? Who's freedom from threat? What is being threatened? And what will you admit as a valid security threat? And what will you dismiss as invalid? So if you tell me that, oh, you know, but uh, uh, yeah, climate change is a real issue, but we'll be fine in Bombay because we have tall buildings. Then I am not really sure you understand threat or security. Forget climate change. But if you think, okay, we are all, if there is a problem and people in the Arctic are losing their homes, but that's a problem for me. If you understand that our secure, that our well being is connected. If you tell me, you know, uh, we have to think about security issues, so we need to buy more arms. We cannot antagonize X country because they sell us the weapons we need to fight Y country, which is buying them from Z country. Then, uh, you know, I'm very impressed by your logic, but I want to know if you are really safe after all that shopping. Your country is safe. You have a good arsenal. Your borders may be safe or may not be safe. Whose security are we talking about? And what is the threat? What is threatening you? So, we you know, when we study security, we don't take these things for granted. Policymakers sometimes simplify, sometimes have to simplify. But when we, have the, when we are committed to thinking also in a scholarly way, it becomes important to constantly um, rake over the coals and keep asking these questions. So what are, would be the threat for individuals? If you think it is valid to talk about the threat to individuals, to hum humans, individuals face physical threats. They may be run down by a bus, sexual violence, cultural threats when tomorrow suddenly you tell me I cannot speak my language or teach my language. Societal threats, I cannot wear hijab. Economic threats, half my, the money in my pocket is invalid, or I can't find jobs because, you know, such and such industry is now being changed. Ecological threats, because 
the sea may rise and there may be no fish for me to fish. Um, public health, which we know about, emotional, which we're all going to be dealing with post COVID. For states, threats can be physical, political, if someone is trying to constantly, for example, undermine your elections. Someone is hacking into your election system, that's a political threat. Economic, the threat of recession, cultural threats, societal, ecological, and for the whole world, because we are also one, right? We are not naturally in these little colored boxes called countries. The threats are the same, physical, ecological, economic, public health. So what, what are we talking about here as we walk slowly towards feminist foreign policy, which is like the last speck on this story? What does it mean when we take these three nouns and we say these are the ways in which we understand them and then we put them together and make a sentence? You know, you have sa, pa, sa, and you put them together, you sing them separately, they have a value. You put them together, they become a tune, but what is this tune? What, is it, what does it mean to engender peace and security? So first let's take two of the words, gender and insecurity, They're deeply related because gender, our ideas about gender, patriarchy, are sources of insecurity from the beginning. If I have a baby and the doctor says this is a girl and from the beginning that girl feels I'm actually a boy. In my heart, I'm a boy. What I want to be like is a boy. I want to do the things you tell me boys do. I want to dress in those clothes. And the entire time I, as a mother or an aunt or a teacher or a boss later say, no, 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 that's wrong. Let me give you shock treatment. Let me send you somewhere. Then my gender is a source of insecurity for me. My gender identity, your gender values are all a source of insecurity. And I'm putting all of this on a spectrum because you cannot keep saying feminism, feminism, feminism and divide the personal and the public. Right? Gender is a source of insecurity. If you tell me that, you know, uh, I have so much uh, dal, this much I'll give my daughter, this much I'll give my son, because my son has to grow up, no, what? If you tell me that the only value, and I have read this in official documents that I won't name, if you say, you know, pregnant mothers must be given excellent prenatal care because they are the mothers of the sons who will run this country. And I'm sorry, I want to starve you for five days. And as you can find out, I'm a very violent person. But these things make me very angry. Your prejudice that women are like this, men are like this, somebody else's trans people are like that is making you act in ways that are making them hungry, making them sick, depriving them of opportunity, making them insecure. Gender makes people invisible. And we see this after every crisis, when all our plans, when our normal plans are all designed around a certain structure of family and home where men get pick up the relief, men get all the ration cards, men get the relief documents. And when we are very magnanimous, we make provision for sanitary napkins and we consider female-headed households. But between these two, what about non-binary people? So gender also invisibilizes people. In a political party, you know, we have now had 30 odd years of local government reservations. Assembly elections are happening candidate lists must be made. You know, it is really amazing that all our states have had between 30 and 50% reservation, but somehow political party leaders still cannot 
see women. No, there are no women. How, how are there no women? Five, five years they are serving here and there. How are you not seeing them? Gender creates, makes people invisible and then makes them insecure because you are not providing for, you are not taking care of, you are not protecting the rights of people you do not consider as existing. Gender values under patriarchy are just are defined by inequality. Somebody is more important than somebody else. If you layer over other factors like caste and class and religion and language and everything, then bus, you only have inequality. You have no normal equal relationships, which means immediately you have discrimination, you have violence because vi violence is the language of inequality. Right? We're not sitting like perfect mathematical equations. We express inequality through discrimination and through violence. And then, worst of all, through excusing people for violence. No, poor thing, he was angry. You know, you know how much frustration there is? Men are losing their jobs. He is so passionate about his beliefs, he bludgeoned someone to death. This, so the, there is an intimate, inextricable, inalienable relationship between gender and insecurity. Then let's move one more step down this journey. Insecurity, conflict and militarization have an impact on our ideas of gender. So when we are in crisis, those, we may not be thinking all the time, gender, gender, what do I think? You know, my values hai. We don't think about this every day because life has other demands on us. No? When we are in crisis, all those ideas that we did not know we had become stronger. What does it mean to be a man? There is a flood, and in the most feminist of families, somebody will say, there are no men in this house, otherwise somebody would have gone and got milk. Point may actually be there is no younger person in the house. Uh, everybody in this house is sick. It could be all those things, but we will gender that. Reinforce our idea that women do this, men do this. What does it mean to be a woman? Women are more caring. There's a crisis. Women will be more nurturing. Or we don't understand what's happening to us. We have both lost our jobs. We have a 16-year-old daughter, a 9-year-old son, a 4-year-old daughter. People are getting coronavirus like flies and dropping like flies. We don't don't know what will happen tomorrow. My daughter will be insecure. I will marry her off. She will become somebody else's problem. So everybody will be insecure. What about nine and four? Where do other genders fit when our ideas of man and woman become more rigid? And where are the accommodations we make for invisible sexual minorities? And then you tangle it up further with this imaginary thing called nation or community, you know, my community, this small subsect of this subcaste or this nation, my mother nation, my father nation. All these ideas about gender become more and more mixed up. Who will fight for the nation? Are you wearing bangles? You know, is mother, is my mother nation riding on a, uh, on a, on a lion carrying weapons? What, what is, how do we think about nation, gender, violence, insecurity, conflict? It's even more dramatically mixed up. How do we experience insecurity because of our genders? Not how does gender cause insecurity? Security, but how do we experience insecurity? Well, whenever we are in crisis, whether it is a pandemic or an earthquake 
or a war or a riot or displacement because of a development project, the first thing that happens, which is why the so-called shadow pandemic of domestic violence should not have surprised anybody. The first thing that happens is that levels of gender-based violence go up. Because who can you hit when you are upset? Literally, who can you lash out at? The person who has less power than you. The person that you will be able to hit out at curse, abuse, beat, with everyone saying, poor thing, life is so difficult. Spectrum of violence is the first gendered experience of insecurity. Militarization, higher levels, people carrying weapons, police posts everywhere, nobody asking questions, limitations on your rights, when these things happen, then who is going to go to the police over something like street sexual harassment? Right? They have bigger problems in life. Check post checking. Ask young women in Kashmir. You know, they get felt up at check posts in the name of security. What happens to young men? If somebody has a problem somewhere, they go out to they go out to meet a friend or to apply for a job, they never come home. Enforced disappearances, and I tell my students this, when I was studying English grammar in school, to disappear was, a transitive, was an intransitive verb, meaning there was no object. Something disappeared. It has now, now become a transitive verb, meaning something, when you, someone disappears something, you disappear a person. You pick them up in a white van. You pick them up in a white, black van. You pick them up in a Jeep. They're never heard of again. This happens more to men. It's not just when I talk about gender experiences. I am not talking only about women. Please remember that. Things happen more to women, but they also happen. Displacement breaks up families. And with every displacement, families become poorer. They become, they lose their support system. They're more vulnerable to exploitation, which means trafficking also. Land alienation happens to families, but there are many kinds of agriculture where women are the primary tillers, women are the primary workers, and those are unrecognized. Ecological destruction, longer distances to be walked for water, for firewood. Let's talk about civil rights and liberties. When a woman speaks out in the public sphere, when a man speaks out in the public sphere, he's under threat, he can be disappeared, he can be killed. When a woman speaks out in the public sphere, she is threatened with rape. Her children are threatened with rape. Her family is threatened with violence or kidnapping. Governance failures, again, what we've seen in the last four years. But also, I mean, I should give you some happy news so you'll all be crying by the time I finish. Crises also become a time when because men go away to fight or men go away to seek jobs, women become leaders and decision makers. And there are organizations like Swayam Shikshan Prayog that find that have found the entry point of a crisis to become a time to enter and train and truly empower. I'm very ambivalent about the word empower for many reasons, but truly empower women to become the decision makers they are. So then come to peace and gender. You cannot have peace that is gender. You must have a peace that is gender just, right? Justice is peace. But to be gender just, it must include an inclusive peace process. And I'm now thinking of post-conflict processes. Everybody must be part of that. And I, I think uh, Dr. Simi made a point about, she quoted the statistic about 
uh, inclusive peace processes yielding more sustained and long lasting durable peace arrangements. It's absolutely true. You have to hold people responsible for sexual violence. You have to have a transitional justice process that is gender sensitive, meaning that you uh, listen to women, you make it possible for them to speak. You seek out gender minorities. Open the door. Don't assume that everyone who will come to your commission of inquiry will be a man. And you, you need a post-conflict order or a post-crisis order that is just, meaning if you did not already do it, you must recognize and outlaw gender discrimination. You must provide the right to equality as the foundational human right. You know, we uh, there are many, many things you can comment on the Indian constitution. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but I have this little spark of pride always that the first right in the fundamental rights chapter in our constitution is the right to equality. Because without this, what do you have? So I want to spotlight a couple of issues here very quickly. Um, one is the spectrum of violence. All forms of sexual and gender-based violence lie on a continuum, which begins with interpersonal violence, right? When I get on a bus and someone pinches my bottom. But it ends where, when you ignore this, when you think, it's okay, I didn't feel it, it doesn't happen. And yeah, I know he's very rude to his wife, but his life is like that. When you excuse all this, it builds up into this large social habit of state violence. Then you accept it from your government. You excuse it in warlike situations. And you accept it in a situation that you label violent extremism which usually means impunity on both sides. That you can rape, you can loot, you can molest, you can abduct, you can enslave, or what we saw in Bosnia-Herzegovina, because we're not just talking about India, enforced pregnancies, forced impregnation. You can do all this because there is a cause, there is a reason, there is a justification. A rise in early in gender violence is an early warning indicator of conflict. So you are seeing the numbers go up of certain kinds of things. Child marriage, for example, is a huge indicator. And child marriages in India have been rising steadily for a long time now. When you juxtapose them in conflict situations, you know, there is a problem. People are insecure. They are marrying their children off also because they don't know how long they'll be around or they want to palm off the responsibility. But why? Because they are not sure of the future. Why are they not sure of the future? Then it's my job to find the answer to that question. And then the proliferation of legal and illegal arms, again, leads to femicide, violence against women. If you have a gun, guns don't cause violence, but if people have guns, then it's just, you know, they're there. They're there for using. Let's look at conflict and militarization. Okay? Again, we talked about stereotypes a little bit. And so it's a bit of a running race to go through this, but I want to go through all of it. Um, there is the gendered impact of conflict. Who gets killed? Who gets hurt? Who gets displaced? Is very gendered. Men are hurt and abducted and recruited much more than women who are then abandoned, widowed, left to fend for themselves, exploited, trafficked, raped. Conflict erodes community support networks. You don't know who is your friend. You don't know who has defected. You don't know which camp they have ended up in. And I have my students read a lot of fiction because nothing gives you the feel of the human impact of a situation as much as literature does. I can lecture and you can read a dozen articles, but when you read somebody's poem or diary or letter, it will tell you what you need to know. All of these consequences are gendered. And I want to talk about governance failures because we don't include them in our consideration of security very much, and I think we should. 
governance failures are when you're when things that are supposed to what is the point of a state we don't organize states because it feels nice it looks pretty they're supposed to do something they're supposed to keep the society peaceful in all the ways we meant that people are supposed to get roti kapda makan they're supposed to be able to go to a doctor they're supposed to be schools in modern society the purpose of a state is the delivery of welfare the more marginal you are in terms of gender or class or caste the less access you have to any of this if your location in society determines your access then governance has failed because if you look at definitions of governance one of them is actually equity good governance is defined by equity by reach good governance is equity and equity is essential for peace and this because gender determines your position in society along with other factors is a critical way in which so now i'm going to come to the topic of your course and i won't take very long over it because i understand this is the opening lecture i began to write about feminist foreign policy actually if you will allow me to say this before it became a topic when hillary clinton became secretary of state having known her to be a lifelong feminist and having thought about foreign policy for much of my life i said okay what does it mean when the secretary of state of the world's most powerful country whether you like it or not is a feminist you can quibble with her brand of feminism that's a different debate but she is a feminist and i began to look at the things the people she met on her trips the choices she made uh, the speeches she gave you know starting from beijing but really also in her official role she appointed this uh, she appointed an, an ambassador for women's affairs and so on and then what are the limitations of bringing that politics into a state that is not explicitly feminist states are not feminist okay um and then of course hillary clay came hillary went and then with marco wallstrom you had all of these other people begin one after the other after the other and you saw that in the buddhis presentation and what is this meant for sweden it was emphasis on human rights so they got into a big fight with saudi arabia on this for canada it has been women's empowerment a women's fund etc for france also development assistance mexico has said we will focus on development and education and then in you know, recent years since 2020 icwa has been doing these seminars that are also about feminist foreign policy and there are some of us who say what we say anywhere and there are others who make the case for india not needing a feminist foreign policy because we are already a gender sensitive gender inclusive enlightened modern looking state where we have empowered women so much that we no longer need an apostrophe s in women's empowerment so now we only have women empowerment right i'm sorry this is my little complaint why can we not see women's empowerment anymore properly anyway so we say okay we look at all the women in the foreign service we had a woman foreign minister we've had a woman prime minister to bas hamara to ho gaya and 1325 yes women peace and security agenda but we are not fighting with anybody you know so it doesn't apply to us okay so when we connect the spectrum of politics that people like vibhuti or me or ruth manorama or kamla basin or anuradha kapoor any of us that know each other that listen to each other that follow our each other's work vishakha datta when you took it all, all the things that we do in the name of feminism and we believe in the fame name of feminism and you look at this you think okay is the soul it is i started i asked that question 
First, what does it mean to have a feminist foreign policy? What does feminism bring to peace work? And the articles that I have listed are actually my early explorations. What is the answer to this question? The thing is, it's, it's different for everyone. It determines by your expediency. Like if you are making you know, a speech for a government in the UN forum, then you will make a certain speech. You will list the scheme, that thing, so many sewing machines. And from, your, from the point of view of your need to make a statement, that will be an answer. It will be your experience if you are a privileged person and you come from privilege and you think, you know, well, come on, in 75 years, we've made a lot of progress and life is not good and I have a PhD. So, you know, now women have PhDs. Then from your experience and perspective, maybe correct. The answer to this question question, what is feminist foreign policy? Why should foreign policy be feminist is an easier question to answer if you're a feminist. But what does it mean for foreign policy to be feminist is harder. Also, do you need to have a certain qualification? I mean, you take France, Sweden, Mexico, Canada, did they have some background, something in their history that qualified them? Or can we all, all say, I'd say feminist foreign policy? You know, and I think of, I was thinking about this. I was thinking Gandhiji had this idea that you could not just become a satyagrahi because you, know, you wanted to. You had to prepare yourself. Andar se sadhna karna padata. You had to learn to be a certain way, live a certain way, be a certain way, change something in your heart. You have to prepare to be a satyagrahi. And then I think of Iqbal, Khudi ko kar buland itna, ke har takdeer se pehle, khuda bande se khud puche bata, teri raza kya hai. Make yourself so strong that you can determine the course of your, your fate. And I think, what do I have to do? Who do we have to become as a country in order to have a feminist foreign policy? Or does it not matter at all? So the point I want to leave you with is, when you do this course and you listen to all of us, we are all thinking through issues and working on them. The most important thing for you is to go out with questions because the answers will keep changing. I want you to think always, what is the question here? As a citizen, what is the question I have for this? And that is the only way to move from one, uh, from one point to another, from one level to another, from one depth to, to another. Last month, I finally got to visit Rani Niva, so all about step wells, to move down from one level of the step well to the other, to the other, till we reach the core. So on that note, I will hand the floor back to the chairs. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Sarna. Yatiji, would you like to speak? Hello? Would you like to respond? I think, Swarna, you have flagged off so many questions. I think crystallize or collective wisdom of the women's movement of last 50 years and raise so many important questions uh, that only representation doesn't solve the problem. Our own thinking about uh, uh, intersectionality and about the solidarity, transnational solidarity, that is very, very important. And uh, now there are questions in the uh, question box. The first question is that in any conflict, women suffer in many ways. Rape is used as a weapon of war. We see this all in world wars. Terrorism is new attack on women. Do you think if we have more people in diplomacy, will it have any positive impact? 
on the content and tone of diplomacy, Prakash Almeida. Terrorism. And yeah. uh, um, will it make a difference to more people? I assume I'm going to actually answer that in two ways, because I think you may have meant more people, more feminists or more women, but I'm going to take that at two levels, because I want to say that there are uh, at least two ways in which we do diplomacy, right? There is official state diplomacy, and it certainly will help if we have more women, but it'll just help if we have a greater diversity of voices in the service. And um, I think we may be inching there, but you know, it's never fast enough. So it would be much nicer to see more communities, more genders, openly so um, in the service. And I think that the a diversity of voices and a diversity of perspectives will also help us to connect with more people in other places and to have a better grasp of the totality of human experience everywhere. Um, but the, there is another side to this, because the other kind of diplomacy is the diplomacy of you and me, you know, the, the ordinary people. Because I think as we connect with each other in our efforts to learn about each other, in our efforts to connect as human beings, if you're in a foreign airport, you know, and somebody is suddenly doubling over in their seat and tears are coming out of their eyes. Do you say, I have an Indian passport? Or do you go up to them and say, is, are you okay? Do you, do you need something? This connection that we have this amazing gift as human beings to feel for each other and connect. That is a kind of diplomacy that I think is irreplaceable. And you don't have to be in a foreign airport to do it. It begins with reading newspapers. It begins with trying to understand another person's point of view. Why are they saying this? Why are they thinking that? What is their experience within your country, beyond your country? It's seeking out opportunities. You know, if you're on social media, if you're on Instagram, find some Sri Lankan handles and look at their art. Simple things. This will certainly, it, there's room for everybody in it and it'll certainly make a difference to how, how we see the world, how we see each other, including the way in which we understand gender and gender relations. I think Several this kind of people-to-people -people solidarity we had seen during 70s when Cuba was isolated. There was a mm -hmm. trade embargo. And whenever mm -hmm. any people made it a point to travel to Cuba you know, as a tourist, and they would carry mm -hmm. in their bag whatever 20 kg you were allowed, they would take grains and shoes and medicine, whatever Cuba needed. You no know, People mm -hmm. would know from the newspaper that what all was. And that was mm -hmm. really, it allowed the country not to get eliminated you know, because the people, mm -hmm. tried. they also learned the message of solidarity. And currently also you have seen that yeah. during the pandemic, it is only Cuban doctors and they say who did not yes. charge anything. They, they went yeah. to African countries uh, out of like completely voluntary really you know they were not even forced or yeah. there was no yeah. lure for money for that. Absolutely. so i think it's a very important my question to you is that what are the learnings of rwanda or somalia or bosnia in a post-war situation and what role did women play because rwanda we see that even the women parliamentarian 45 percent of parliamentarians are now women so what kind of new culture and the new ecosystem they have brought one of the, the public arena the things that we have seen in the 90s and the early 2000s is that wherever there was conflict and wherever there was a UN intervention the post-conflict dispensation actually makes gender equality provisions in the con in the constitution a lot of quotas at every level and insistence on certain kinds of which means that in the short run you see a surge in women's presence and participation in the Rwandan case because of the impact of the genocide, they've also been instrumental as they dominate parliament in pushing through a lot of laws that benefit women. The same thing, the same UN presence and the same insistence on gender equality provisions has not had the same impact in Afghanistan and Nepal because the cultures into which they were embedded 
remained deeply patriarchal yeah. and those measures were adopted resentfully. Like there is a case study I remember reading about Nepal where, you know, in the first constitution after the quotas, in the first parliament after the quotas were introduced, women got up to speak and men went out to smoke, you know. So that's, people were vote with their feet. They're telling you what they think about the quota. I think about that a lot in, in Afghanistan, of course, there were all sorts of quotas and women were included everywhere. But in the coming and going, there was no security in the state. So, you know, that was um, balanced out or cancelled out. So, there is a question. I don't know if that there is There are seven questions. Question. There are many, many yes. questions. Can I go <laughs> through, yeah, yeah, through them quickly and answer and them? Can also yeah. speak. Yeah. Yes. Both of them, they can also speak. I have brought them to speak. Yeah, yeah. they can speak. Okay. Rupali Tamule. Rupali Tamule, are you there? Rajiv Kumar, Nipanjali Sharma, Tanuja Sachdev, Abdullah Ibrahim, Salahuddin, Sipo Kazi Toto, Tanuja Sachdev. Please unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, good evening, ma'am. This is Nipanjali Sharma. Mm -hmm. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, you yeah, are. Can we see you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and just one second. Uh, Ma'am, you were just mentioning the code of Gandhiji. So I read about Gandhiji in various books and I want to know your views on Gandhiji. It may be that I am not completely knowing Gandhi's view. So I want to know about yours. Oh, please. Okay. Who am I to have a view on Gandhiji? But <laughs> I think your written question was, what do I think of Gandhiji? views on women. Yes, I think that Gandhiji, you know, in our age, we have a habit of judging people by what we think today. But people are a product of their age and their time. And the best use we can make of them is to take what we want and leave the rest. Because otherwise, the little precious time we have to make the world better is going to be spent on criticizing somebody who lived 100 years before us, and who's ocean of work we will never quite comprehend because it was an ocean of work and one of the things that I marvel at quite irrelevant is just how much they used to write from the morning till the night they answered postcards wrote articles met people you know spun khadi like what a full day I sit on the computer check mail four times and think what come what so I think if you think of the way people live their lives and anybody, all our lives are full in retrospect. Who am I to judge? I am not interested in, I am not looking to Gandhiji to tell me what to think about women and feminism. I am looking to him for other things. So when, for me, I'm not going to judge him as a single package. I'm not going to cancel him. And I also would say I don't know enough to judge anybody. So I, that's my half answer to your question, Deepanjali. But really, you know, we are in 2022. He was, I mean, he's been gone 74 years. Yeah, thank you take so much, ma'am, for answering you, that. Take what you find useful and ignore the rest. Oh, thank you so much, ma'am, for giving me this different view. Yeah. And a second question from my side only, ma'am. You asked, Hello. you told us to raise questions on the policies and on our, in our surroundings. So what will be the ways in which we can start questioning as being a feminist and as, as being a woman? I think the moment someone follows up my speak out, ask questions thing with a question about it, I want to modify and say, because given the times that we live in, select where you ask which question. The easiest question to ask as a student is why? Because you're supposed to know why, right? 
you come to a lecture like this and I say something to you and you're not sure if I really want you to ask questions. Simplest question is why? You know? Oh, why are you saying this? Why are you doing that? Why did you make that decision? It's holding me accountable, but in a way that suggests you just want an explanation. So I think that that's a safe place to begin. And then there are other places. There are op-eds. There is social media. That is where you are sitting to have lunch with your colleagues. These are all places to raise questions. You know, you don't have to be in parliament and you don't have to be in a morcha uh, a gentleman. Where I am is where my citizenship begins. There is a... Hello. Yeah. Dr. Hello. Pritija Gonzalez. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Good afternoon. Yeah. 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 Mr. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. Please introduce yourself. Hello. Go ahead. I'm uh, Dr. Abdullah Ibrahim, Ibrahim. Uh, Kwara State University, Malete. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes, you can yes hear I you. can. Yeah. Please okay. repeat yourself. Yeah. Uh, I am Dr. Abdullah Ibrahim Salahuddin from Kwara State University, Malete, in Nigeria. Wow. Yeah. I am a specialist in uh, philosophy of, uh, of Islamic education. Uh huh. I wish to contribute on the issue of this uh, gender equality mm -hmm. uh, by saying I read a report that uh, the, most the most peaceful country in the world are those uh, countries that put their women, especially their women, on check. And uh, my personal observation, personal opinion on the issue of uh, this uh, gender equality is that there should be a kind of reconstruction of the thoughts in the sense that gender equality may not be naturally achieved, but gender justice as our eminent uh, speaker has said is uh, achievable. Gender justice is achievable in the sense that considering the natural, the natural endowment of each gender and putting that to consideration in formulating any foreign policy is more achievable than uh, Use, usage of uh, gender equality. We have different, we have differences between the two genders, physically, mentally, emotionally, morally. So I think in that aspect, we should be, we should take the, the issue of this uh, diversity into consideration in formulating any foreign policy. That is uh, my own uh, contribution to the discourse. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your views. I would say that the question of how natural gender dispositions are is actually the core of the debate. Um, but then if we I take your point to the question of foreign policy and policy, I think that for a state, especially if we don't want the state to intervene in private and personal matters, for a state, gender justice is more actionable, both in domestic policy and in foreign policy, because largely it pertains to the public sphere or to a personal issue that has entered the public sphere. Um, but on the question of, but I am also an activist, and I won't give up on the idea that gender equality is achievable because if I do, I can't wake up in the morning and function. But thank you very much for sharing your views. Um, there were several, the pe several people with questions in the Q 
Q&A who are not on my screen. But would anyone else like to? Ma'am, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, ma'am, can you hear me? My name is Srijita Gonsalves. Yes, ma'am. I am an associate professor in political science in uh, Lady Brabon College, Kolkata. I had yes, a friend and uh, went there. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, my question is, in this uh, contemporary geopolitical world order uh, that we see around us, how do you uh, visualize a feminist like foreign policy? I mean, won't a more realist foreign policy be better or even a new realist one? Like I was visualizing, like if you think, look at our country today, our external affairs minister and the diplomatic overtures we need to do, uh, given the Indo-Pacific turmoils and everything, does a feminist foreign policy even sound worthwhile today? That's all now. I think there are two questions. The first question is on the value of a realist foreign policy. And um, I will ask you a counter question then. What has been the utility of a realist foreign policy in the realist world? Are we in a better world as a result of it? Or are we, are whatever is, since you are a political science professor, um, the things that make the world livable would be my submission to you, are the things that arise out of um, perspectives and efforts in international relations that have centered around the building of regimes and therefore an international consensus around values. I would say it is people who have gone to great pains to mediate and avoid war. So uh, a liberal perspective, a war, a war avoiding, a peace studies kind of perspective. I'm not sure that the realist a realist perspective necessarily lands us in a better world. The second part is what is the value of a feminist foreign policy? And I have, I have my own questions about that, but they don't come from a devaluing of feminist values. They don't come from a rejection of feminist values around equality, justice, nonviolence, um, condemning militarization, putting the state in its place. They don't come from that. They come from precisely the kind of experience that we've seen, say, Afghanistan have. Where, and I just talked about this, where you had a bunch of institutions plonked on a country that had, it, that had not come organically from within. The elites that were ruling the country were still locked into the same patriarchal and uh, feudal systems. So if a country is intrinsically patriarchal, misogynistic, um, unequal, hierarchical, then can we even talk ab about a foreign policy that is for equality, for justice, for gender inclusion, etc.? I am not sure. That's my question. It's not the question that you are asking. So I've exchanged one question for another, like, you know, exchanging scarves and shawls. I would like to uh, hear, place on record that this is the feedback I got from so many people and that why we should not have such discussion on feminist foreign policy. And still we went ahead and we saw massive response. I think it's an important discussion because it allows us to ask questions about feminism and about foreign policy. And as somebody who has been interested in international relations and foreign policy since, I don't know, I would say at least about 45 years now, I firmly believe we don't discuss it enough. Uh, I am very much a product of Nehru in India. But I think that in our adoration of a single person, we have failed to ask questions and asking questions doesn't mean rejecting Nehru's principles. It means exercising our right to understand better 
what it is that foreign policy should be about, what, it is, what is it that is truly in India's interest? And is it different from what is in the interest of the world? I think that the, we have to keep asking questions. I mean, there's just no, this is my mantra of the week. Very important mantra. I think all, all the participants should carry it forward. Uh, are Britika, uh, Britika. I see raised hands, Vibhuti. Yeah, okay. I see Veena, I see Alia. Yeah. And there yeah. was a question from Sifukazi. Yeah. Uh, Acha, I ra raised hand, I don't see, but in QA, there are nine questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, and Alia. Have, yeah. I so please announce their names because I can't see the raised hands. Huh? Let me see. Hi. Okay. Um, Veena Vaswani. Uh, Veena Vaswani is her there. Yeah. Veena, yeah. you can unmute. Yeah. We can see. Alia ji is ready. Alia ji, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, this is Alia from Islamabad, Pakistan. And uh, warm welcome to uh, Vibhuti. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed um the lecture by Swarna. Uh, my question is, how do feminists make inroads to the arenas where foreign policy development takes place? Um, I'm asking this question because uh, I've been involved in policy development exercises uh, in Pakistan and uh, the way the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is the Ministry of External Affairs in India, and the um, Home Affairs Ministry in India, the counterpart of which is the Interior Ministry, these two sort of control the security-related issues and determine uh, how much inroad civil society has into policy development. So any thoughts about that? Um, and I'm encouraged by your uh, nudging to ask questions, Swarna. So that is why I'm asking this one. No, ask Thank me you. this question because this is my pet peeve. You know, I might start jumping up and down here now because I think I want to know why women feminists will talk yes. about rights, will talk about development, will talk about equity, we'll talk about justice, we'll talk about um, the state, they will talk about war and peace, militarization, I mean, that far. But will they engage with government? No. Like they will catch COVID. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, the only way mm -hmm. to engage with government is to engage with government. Right. And how do you do it? Well, more of us need to write those entrance exams, hold our nose, close our eyes, and mm. get into the system. In more right. of, you know, if you're going to look for a government job and enough of us need the security of a government job in South Asia, please try and get into the foreign service, get into the home ministry, get into the police, because unless we are in there, that we, we, we won't even have allies from the outside, right? I think there is no substitute for everyday engagement and engagement does not have to be confrontational. We need to be, uh, you know, uh, about 50 years ago, there was a secessionist movement in the state where I now live. And overnight, there was an anti-secession amendment passed to the constitution. And mm. the, what did the leaders of the movement do? They removed the word secession from their party constitution. Why? They said very simply, we have to be outside to get the change that we want. Mm. What have they done since? For about 30 odd years, they have ruled the state. Mm. So I think that there is some virtue. There is a great deal of virtue in taking on the state, but there is a great deal mm. of virtue in using your discretion to mm. have these conversations outside. Now, yeah, we have them here. We have them in this forum. We have them off this forum. Mm -hmm. We have them in the op-eds that we write, in the petitions that we sign. I think we engage in a number of ways. And I, you know, we take this example of the Me Too mo moment that um, caught us by surprise because so many years we've been 
been talking about workplace sexual harassment. It's not news. It's no surprise. We've all had whispering campaigns about people. And then one fine morning, the accusations start tumbling out of the woodwork. And I think that I think about the power of the termite, you know, mm -hmm. that you nobody knows you're there. Nobody is listening to mm -hmm. you. Nobody is putting you on Snapchat. But one day the wall falls. So mm -hmm. I take heart from that. And I think we persist in asking whoever will listen. We persist in asking even when people don't listen. You know, I know I, I do that. I say, mm -hmm. I won't write, Ari Baba, who's reading? But if I don't write, then the one person who might accidentally read while they are moving Bhelpuri off the newspaper will also not have anything to read. And I have to remember that as much as I say it to anyone else. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think I'm not quite answering questions because I don't want to confess I don't know the answers. You do. found your answer very powerful and reassuring because I had got so much of negative feedback over the last six weeks from my fellow feminists that today I feel we are in the right path. Yeah. That means 100% sure. We must engage. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, thank you. I've been relearning my perspectives on gender with this session. So thank you for that, ma'am. Also to add to my question, you have partly answered how culture has, you know, paved the way in, you know, these interventions. So I would like to understand how the determination of nation states in their hierarchy have had their experiences in the, on the violence of women in Afghanistan versus the invasion in Ukraine. The experiences were very different. Like Could you how slow down and repeat your question? I'm losing it I'm so a little sorry, bit. Yeah, right. Ritika yeah. ji, also introduce yourself. Sorry, I didn't also, get you. Also introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, I'm a research, uh, research scholar in American studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, ma'am. So my question is, the determination of the hierarchies in the international order have had the influ influence on foreign policy interventions. How do you think that these have posted their experiences for violence on women in the Afghanistan invasion versus the invasion in Ukraine? Invasion How in Ukraine, okay. Yeah. I think... I think connect the uh, connecting the Afghanistan invasion to women was just an expediency. You know, it was suitable. They wanted to go in. The plight of women had been horrible for, for a long time, but it was convenient at that moment to make a rhetoric of it and to go in. Uh, so, in some sense because hierarchy, hierarchical power allows you to write the story. I think that's the connection. I don't really have an answer on Ukraine, Britika, because I haven't thought about it. Um, right. So I, I will ask you to tell me what you think it is. Ma'am, certainly I, uh, in my understanding, the access to aid and the access to the refugee policies would have been easier for a Ukrainian woman compared to a woman from Afghanistan. Uh, okay, all right. In that sense, yes, I think true. That's race as much as hierarchy, yeah. So at least in my understanding, this has been easier. So how do we make nation states accountable for such interventions? You go and intervene, that's okay. But you don't posit the consequences of your interventions. So how do we hold nation states accountable for this? At least from a foreign a feminist foreign policy lens. By asking questions, have we asked our own state any questions about its policy on Afghanistan? I haven't. Not because no. I don't have them, because I found reasons not to ask. You know, I have so much work to do. My head is paining. You know, there's also there's also sort of a, a failure on our part. We are not asking. We didn't ask. They didn't admit people for the longest time, and we didn't ask why. In the first week, we were all frantic, fluttering. 
But after that, have we asked, why are you talking to Taliban? What are you talking to Taliban about? Does this mean you recognize the government? What does it mean? What about all the Afghan women? So, but this is my question also, Britika, about the connection between foreign policy and domestic policy. Viputi, can I just speak my mind? What question? Yeah, yeah. please go ahead. What question am I going to ask my government about the women of Afghanistan? When on a day-to-day -day basis, I see no evidence that they care about the women of India. Okay. I mean, as a voter, as an ordinary person, I also go once in five years but I have no evidence that my government cares about. They, they may care about me. I'm an anomaly. They did not care about many, 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 many women who were grievously hurt and wronged over the years. They have not cared about injustice to them. So I will ask you This is my question. Can you have feminist foreign policy when you have misogynistic patriarchal society? But I think I like your metaphor of uh, termite. I think let us be termites, no? We will we work continuously and then the wall will fall. I think I, I found it very, uh, very, very hopeful. So I do too. I do. Yes. I I think, think the insect world is the only way to go. Yeah. Professor Vaswani, would you like Dr. to come? Professor Vaswani, please unmute yourself. Right. Rajiv ji, are you ready? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, please go ahead. Sir, thank you for this knowledgeable session, sir. And good evening to all the you know, all the hosts and participants. My question is that, sir, are you listening to me, sir? Everybody yes. is listening to you. Yeah, yeah ma'am. Uh, my question is that uh, after completing 75 years of independence, it is, a, a st it is a still a big question about the gender equality. Why it has been a big question till now? Because we are 5,000 years of patriarchy. <laughs> yes, Dr. Swarna. Yeah, please go ahead. I have the same, same question. I also want to know what we are doing about, about it. You know, after we finish this session, I'll be asking our MLAs about this. I have a feminist MP. For three more years, I can be proud of it. I will ask her, what is she doing? But are we asking anybody? There are th four more questions. Uh, one minute. Huh? Yeah. Anushi, but wonderful topic. Okay. Uh, Akshara Pathak Jadav. I was thinking about CAA Shahin Bagh while you were talking. Dipanjali Sharma. How can we change the, the member? And how can women contribute to the feminist foreign policy? I will just come back to the same point. Panjali, read, speak, write, ask. Correct. I think the thing is, when we ask this question of how can we change, there's an us and a them. We are the people who are thinking, they are the people who are doing, but actually the us and the them is the same person. So we need to ask with ownership, you know, not what, what are you going to do and will you think about feminine, like, you know, but made our policy here. These are the changes I want to see. So I think uh, exercising citizenship in all these spheres, not just in the sphere of commentary and complaint is important. You know, you don't know how to do it, give me a piece, I'll show you. I won't do it as a consultancy. Am I willing to, to give you one day of my life to show you how it's done? Am I willing to do that? without saying consultancy contract, they do. 
I know Vibhuti is. Vibhuti gives her time very generously. And please, I think all of us are sailing in the same boat, using our knowledge to share with the community and mentoring the younger generation. The only point of them to us. It. No, Vibhuti, it's the only point of knowing something. Correct. And we need to multiply these efforts. That's the only way we can be. And I really am. Today, my major learning is that metaphor of termite. Excellent. The way you have said. Otherwise, you feel so small. You're so ineffective. But then when you, that's the role that we have. And one day, this wall of patriarchy, misogyny, militarism, jingoism will fall. Yeah. Yes. There are some more questions. Uh, Akshara Pathak Jadav, have you asked? Uh, Giri Raja Upadhyay, what suggestion? I think that is about Afghanistan. Uh, Shreya Anwarul Haq, where does feminist foreign policy situate women belonging to religious minority communities in South Asia, especially in India and Pakistan? Shafi uh, okay. Anwarul Haq, would you, would you like to speak? Shafi? Hello? Shafi, you can unmute and speak. Yeah, please. Uh, good evening, one hour. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I think you have already asked me a question, and uh, I really don't know if I have drafted this question rightly, I know, or not, because uh, I'm asking as a layman, and the topic is entirely new for me. So, uh, keeping in view the current political scenario of India and uh, the discrimination of religious minority, uh, uh, minorities have been facing in Pakistan since long. Getting both basing in uh, view, where does feminist uh, foreign policy situate uh, women belonging to these communities? Yeah. Okay. I don't think I know the answer to the question, but I would say, given that I have so many other questions on this, I would say that in order to be able to have a truly feminist foreign policy, you would need to be a society or polity where the question, where minority communities do not need to answer, to ask that question. <coughs> I think, I, I would, it seems logical to me. It seems like a, like a, the, the value, I don't know, the logical, the corollary of having certain values and preferences in our daily lives and in our domestic politics, which include inclusion, acceptance, true citizenship and equality for all communities and all sections would be necessary for claiming to have a feminist foreign policy. Right. Very well said, <laughs> extremely well said. I think with that, we end today's discussion because Dr. today is also the 15th anniversary of uh, Prajna, the organization founded by Dr. Swarna Rajgopal. We congratulate Prajna team for their excellent work for, to strengthen the women's movement and the feminist uh, of collective wisdom in uh, not only in India, but I think with, with other countries also, they have interacted. So thank you, Dr. Swarna. What you have, we have learned from your lecture is that there cannot be peace without economic justice, social justice, environmental justice, gender justice, and distributive justice. Feminist foreign policy aims to have a transnational solidarity to fight against sexual and sexist violence, trafficking of women and children, barbaric behavior of the nation state with the migrants and political refugees, promote education for women and girls, and uh, also ensure economic in, uh, emancipation of women across the world, endorse women's leadership in politics and decision making, and involving women in peace negotiations and treaties. There is an urgent need for an international relation experts to assess socio-cultural, economic, and political issues from an intersectional gendered perspective, as it will ensure deeper appreciation of gender differential impact of responses to the existing as well as unfolding realities. Feminist foreign policy challenges international division of labor that subordinates women by segregating women into a monotonous, low-paid, low-status, dead-end 
industrial jobs and low and precarious jobs in service sector and also platform based gig economy i have so many feminists have focused on this and also created worldwide network organizations to fight against this exploitative order there is a need to deconstruct gender stereotypes uh, of viewing man as either aggressor or protector and women as victim in need of protection throughout the human history we have seen and we have witnessed situations where men have also been victims in conflict situation as prisoners of war and have faced physical and sexual torture as it was experienced in syria it was experienced in uh, even the afghanistan the current report of violation of human rights we are getting uh, that how the taliban is not only uh, violating women but also the men uh, from the different ideological producer so leadership ownership direction action plan support and new uh, concrete ground level data with gender lens are need of an hour to make foreign feminist foreign policy not just a rhetoric but also a reality for which as dr cv mehta said what we need is a three r's rights representation and resources they are extremely important and we uh, with this we end the today's session next time we will be dr vaidya nayanar will be speaking about un security council thank you dr uh, swarna rajgopal once thank you for having me yeah very thank very you. very enlightening just so very reassuring to, and hope generating yeah to give the vote of thanks rikta over to you thank you sir as we come to an end of session 1 on gender peace and security of an online monsoon school program on feminist foreign policy praxis for a peaceful and gender just world order organized by fes india office and impri gender impact study center gisc i tripta bhera researcher impact and policy research institute new delhi would like to propose the formal vote of thanks we are grateful to our expert for the day one of this monsoon school dr swarna rajkopal um thank you so much ma'am for an excellent presentation and interaction we thank our chair professor vibhuti patel and conveners ms jyoti rawal and dr simi mehta and dr arjun kumar we thank all of our participants who have raised pertinent questions and actively participated in today's deliberation we look forward to welcoming you on september 16th at 4 pm indian standard time for our second day of this online monsoon school on the topic gendered dimensions of un security council by distinguished expert dr vahida nenar we are grateful if you are watching us later on youtube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications we hope you continue to join in in the future to our impri web policy talk and web policy learning wishing you all a very good evening thank you Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. See you there.